Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this virtual conference on such a timely topic. I would like to talk today uh, about uh, you know, the perspectives to move from multi-scale simulation of materials uh, to digital twins and why I think this is a topic that uh, all materials research uh, scientists uh, uh, should somehow have on their agenda. We all know that you know the development uh, and actually manufacturing of many uh, complicated products, be it in aerospace, be it in the electronics industry or in the automotive industry, is not possible without tools from computer-aided product development. Uh, if you look at the manual of the Airbus uh, 380, then it's about 450,000 pages. And if you would print that, then you get basically a truckload full of paper. And you can ask how anybody reads this manual. And actually, more interestingly, who has written this manual? Um, and the answer is that the manual is encoded almost entirely in tools from computer-aided product development. And that means that there is a so-called digital twin that is a digital representation of every piece of equipment, of every wire, um, and of every material and component uh, that is part of this airplane. Um, and all of this is you know, put together on a computer, tested for consistency, and then actually you know, given to the people uh, in segments who produce this or that part of the airplane. Um, now, this has accelerated product development tremendously uh, in many of these industrial sectors. And as a matter of fact, you would be completely non-competitive you know, if you uh, wouldn't use these tools today. Um, However, if you look at the materials, then the materials are still essentially measured, right? So they are an input to these computer-aided tools uh, and not an output of digital twins for materials. And the reason for that lies in the multi-scale challenge uh, that we have if we want to describe materials and their processing, because uh, we query in such a product materials typically at the micrometer scale and above. Uh, but we manipulate materials at the nanometer scale and below. And there simply isn't a single simulation method that would enable us you know, to bridge all of these scales. And so therefore, uh, you know, we, we have to start to think about what we can do as material scientists uh, to contribute to the development of digital twins, because once we have them available, uh, we can anticipate you know, similar progress in materials development uh, as we have seen in the industries that use computer-aided product development today. Uh, so, so what's a digital twin? Um, and you know, I would like to give you here at the beginning sort of an example for device simulation in the semiconductor industry. This is a slide which comes from one of our industrial partners. Um, and uh, what you have on the right-hand side is basically circuit design software. Uh, with which you know an engineer can design a circuit and then you know send it to some fab where it will be fabricated. And what you have on the left uh, are models for all the components which are called needed uh, in order to make these uh, devices. And so the models for the components can be very complex, but ultimately they are encoded in a standardized set of what is called uh, the process design kit that not only you know, encodes the function of the device and you know, all kinds of uh, multi-physics parameters, you know, such as heat conduction, uh, uh, electrical performance, and so on and so forth, um, but also you know, how it needs to be manufactured. And, and, and this transfer, uh, conceptually, I think, uh, is a good idea uh, you know, uh, that we should develop for a lot of other materials uh, so that they can fit into the modern production lines of uh, the industry that requires these materials. Um, and so what is a digital twin? Well, the rationale in industry is, of course, you know, the application and the commercial benefit. Um, so if you look at the digital twin of something like a robotic hand, which I've shown you here, then you know, the uh, customer of this robot can use the digital twin to plan the production plant um, before either the robot or the plant is actually built, right? And that saves an enormous amount of time and it allows basically 
you know, uh, concurrent development of both of these. And so the benefit is clearly speed and cost, right? Um, in addition, you know, of course, there is application related optimizations of these products, right? Uh, that are able, you know, enabled by the availability of digital twins. Um, now, most of us are in science. And so the question is, you know, are there also benefits for us or do we develop digital twins if we do so, you know, only for the sake of others? And I would argue that there are also benefits for us because many new materials that we develop today are very, very complex. Um, uh, in particular, at universities, we never have the money to, you know, uh, fully exploit the design space or chemical space because, you know, uh, our R&D resources are just insufficient. So digital twins would enable us and maybe this is a generalized uh, definition of a digital twin, um, uh, you know, to uh, look at much larger chemical and design spaces than we can do sort of experimentally. Um, and so therefore there is like a cost benefit ratio of the digital twin because we see um, that, um, you know, computation gets cheaper and cheaper, right? While, you know, the cost of experiments stays also improves, but you know, follows a different uh, uh, um, uh, curve. Um, and so, you know, uh, we can cover a, a lot more experiments if we have reliable simulation protocols. And also we should kind of take a long-term view because if we can, you know, reuse simulation protocols for components in ever more complex uh, uh, situations and environments. So, you know, if you look at the materials research, then, you know, traditionally, basically it has been driven by experiment, right? And sort of, you know, uh, over these various scales and these various questions, experiments have been performed in order to develop and test materials. Um, and, you know, in, if, you, if you look at materials, which actually makes it into industrial applications, then, you know, typically we talk about a decade or longer uh, for this process to take. Uh, but we are faced now you know, uh, with actually a great opportunity um, because modeling simulation and maybe aided you now by something like artificial intelligence enables us at the moment you know, to already address many of these components of these questions. Uh, but clearly only in isolated cases are we capable of putting them together to get something like what we would call a digital twin. And while we are already making some progress in multi-scale simulation, you know, the modeling of the processes remains, I think we should admit, a significant challenge. Um, so the question is, how can we go forward, right? And, uh, you know, that is, I would like to discuss today uh, in some sort of uh, concrete example, um, which not surprisingly comes from our own research. Um, so, you know, we have been working for, uh, you know, more than a decade now on organic electronics and it is a charming application area because um, you know there are applications which are already on the market most of the mobile phones that you hold in your hands have an OLED display simply because it's at the moment uh, the most energy and cost efficient device um, on the other hand you know there's lots of applications which we might wish for OLEDs or organic electronics that don't really work yet um, you know, we have small screens under control, but not really big screens. That's why OLED TVs are still very, very expensive. Uh, OLED Lightning, you know, has many uh, nice uh, features, uh, but at the moment, the equivalent of a 40 watt light bulb, um, you know, costs something like, you know, 200 euros. Um, and, you know, also organic photovoltaics, right? The inverse process, which would capture light to generate electricity um, is not yet uh, as competitive as we would uh, want. Um, and so therefore, you know, if you work in this area, you have, you know, sort of a direct demand from industry because people are constantly trying to make better OLED devices. Um, and then there is another set of questions which relate more to fundamental research. Um, so, so what do we know? Well, we know that transport in organic semiconductors is governed by this local electronic structure of uh, typically amorphous films. Um, and so what we know very well, you know, is how to calculate this electronic structure for isolated molecules. We also kind of know how to deal with this if we put them into a crystalline solid, um, uh, where, you know, these then form bands, you know, in organic materials, these bands are relatively boring and flat. 
Um, but you know, in almost all devices, we don't have uh, crystals. Um, and so instead we have amorphous materials and these amorphous materials are characterized uh, by local electron affinity and the local ionization potential. Um, and then you know, uh, these follow a Gaussian distribution and basically the width of this Gaussian distribution uh, demonstrate uh, uh, or is re responsible for the mobility in these materials. Now, looking at this formula, you see immediately that you know, you know, large disorder, you know, meaning large width generates catastrophic mobilities. And indeed, you know, most organic semiconductors have a mobility which is 12 orders of magnitude lower uh, than that of silicon. And that's, you know, uh, one of the uh, main problems uh, in making devices out of these materials. Uh, on the other hand, what we know is we can understand very well what is the elementary hopping process. Um, because uh, Marcus theory, uh, you know, gives us a very good estimate of the you know, hopping rates for electrons, holes, or also excitons. Um, and you know, uh, the components which go into this formula for Marcus for the Marcus rate, we can all calculate from electronic structure theory. Right? And so uh, we might say that there is a hope, right, to build a model um, in which we can actually calculate this and. Uh, uh, this model should then go, uh, you know, from the atomistic details which we need in order to calculate the electronic uh, structure that goes into this uh, formula, um, all the way up, you know, to the uh, mesoscopic physics that lives sort of on the micrometer scale um, that captures how the device would. Um, and so therefore we need a multi-scale simulation approach, right? Because we need this atomistic picture for the morphology. On the basis of that, we can then, you know, derive and understand the local electronic structure, right? And for this, uh, you know, we can then feed uh, into uh, theories for devices and charge transport, which operate on much, much larger scales, right? And if you systematically develop these methods and you piece them together, then you know we might at some point hope to arrive at something what is actually a quantitative approximation. And at the moment, I want, uh, with the rest of this talk, uh, like to give you an idea uh, of where we are in this process. Right? So let's start with the morphology generation. These films are made by physical vapor deposition, where you dump molecules onto some substrate, and it is uh, you know, possible you know, to develop a computational uh, method that simulates this quite efficiently, uh, you have to make some approximations and, you know, uh, they are noted down there in these uh, papers. Um, uh, here you see sort of an individual molecule that searches for some nice place uh, in this landscape, right? And, you know, uh, after this has explored um, the surface of this uh, uh, film, then it will settle into some nice configuration and uh, you know, uh, the film will continue to grow. So what you see here is only just the end point of the deposition um, of each of these molecules. And then, so if you run this and it takes now sort of on some reasonable computer setup, uh, you know, a few hours, you get a hundred nanometer cube sample um, of uh, uh, such a device. And so now you have to look at the electronic structure. Right? Um, and there we need tools from electronic structure theory and particularly quantum chemistry um, uh, in order to elucidate what's going on. Um, and uh, what we need to compute is the energy disorder or you know, other uh, quantities that are uh, relevant for this. Um, uh, and the problem is that you need you know, to look at essentially all of these sites, right? Um, uh, and, and all of the possible processes and you know, that you cannot really do at the moment by looking at bulk uh, calculations uh, for uh, the whole sample. So what we've done in the past is, you know, develop uh, uh, partitioning schemes uh, that enable us to iteratively compute the electronic structure uh, of, you know, uh, individual uh, constituents such as uh, polarons or excitons um, and, their rates. And then if you then uh, 
take an analytic formula, which I want to discuss uh, for a moment, uh, in order to compute the mobility, uh, then in this analytic formula, you find all the constituents that you previously had in the Marcos rate. So what you have here is you know, the width of this energy distribution, the disorder, which I told you about. Um, Uh, then, uh, secondly, uh, you have you know the uh, reorganization energy lambda, right? And here is you know the expectation value of the hopping matrix elements, uh, which also go into the Marcos rate. So you know, putting all of these together, you know, you get in this case an analytic model. Uh, uh, for the electron mobility, you know, and given the sensitivity on this disorder parameter, which is here, um, it is not surprisingly that we are not quantitative, um, but you know, we get this to uh, about a factor of 10, you know, uh, of the uh, experimental value for both the electrons and the holes. I know you can say, okay, you got lucky, and you know, this is what I encourage, you know. Uh, towards uh, the development of sort of a consistent theory is you know, to then uh, run this on a set of materials which we could ex get experimental numbers. Um, and you, you then arrive you know, uh, for estimates of uh, the whole mobility for different materials. Um, and you can see that basically over 10 orders of magnitude uh, in the mobility, uh, you get this more or less order of magnitude of factor 10 agreement um, uh, with uh, theory, right? And so now that means we can kind of assume that we have a predictive model um, for the you know, uh, basic electronic processes um, uh, uh, that happen in these materials. Uh, we recently published a paper also on excitons, so this doesn't work just for holes. Um, uh, and, and electrons, but also for electronically excited states. And, and so now you have a toolkit um, which you can apply for a lot of materials, right? The good news, and that's why I've been talking about this analytical model uh, at the moment, is that you can interpret it. So if you take this formula for the mobility here again, and you just take the logarithm, um, uh, then you arrive at the logarithm of the um, uh, mobility uh, as being uh, made up out of uh, multiple components, right? The first part is basically the ideal mobility of a crystalline uh, organic material, which doesn't have any reorganization energy. And not surprisingly, or maybe a little bit surprisingly, um, for all the uh, materials, this is relatively uh, uh, constant. Um, and it uh, you know, kind of gives you the upper bound of, you know, uh, what you can expect of uh, molecular materials of this size in terms of mobility. This is still not super good, right? But as you see here from the experimental data, uh, it is uh, much, much better of what we have today, right? And then uh, you can kind of switch on reorganization, right? And uh, that then leads, you know, to a reduction that is the green arrow, right, um, uh, of the mobility. Um, uh, and, and this is no major effect, right? It costs you uh, about an order of magnitude, right? But if that was all, you still had a pretty good conductor, right? And then uh, this order kicks in, right? And this order has two components, um, which come from different sources, and therefore uh, we can you know, consider them independently. One is what we call the intrinsic disorder, and the intrinsic disorder tells you, um, uh, it comes from twisting the molecule when you deposit it. Right? And one comes from polarization disorder, and polarization disorder comes from uh, the effect of the environment, uh, because every polar one you know, uh, sees a different environment. And for the different materials, you know, this leads to now drastic reductions um, in the mobility. Right. So this one, unfortunately, is easy to twist, right? And twisting has a huge effect, right? And so you have this reduction, and then uh, it is also a very polarizable molecule. Right. Uh, and so far, you have another huge reduction again. Right. And on the basis of this, you can then start with molecular design. So taking this molecule that I've just shown you, you can ask, how can I do better? And you can do better by substituting the ligands, which you know, chemists love to make. 
Um, but, uh, you know, as it turns out, it, it takes a chemist, you know, about a year to make like a new ligand and to attach it uh, to this ALQ3 molecule. Um, and so therefore, you know, you want to screen this on a computer, right? And so we, you know, uh, took a bunch of uh, uh, conceivable um, uh, ligands. We have to check, you know, that uh, the HOMO and LUMO levels of the material stay sort of the same because otherwise, you know, they wouldn't fit into the devices anymore. Um, uh, but luckily there is a huge set which, you know, kind of fulfills this requirement. Right? And uh, within those, we can then, you know, run, um, this protocol that I've mentioned uh, and calculate the charge carry mobility, right? Now, lots of them uh, have actually worse charge carry mobility, so we don't want them, right? Uh, but there are some which have a better charge carry mobility. This one all the way to the right, unfortunately, has not quite the right homo and lumo levels. So this is the best candidate. Um, uh, and that uh, means, you know, uh, that is sort of something that we can check experimentally. Uh, uh, we were lucky to find, uh, you know, chemists who invested the year to make the material and physicists uh, who invested another year to make the device and test it. Um, and you now uh, this uh, uh, shows us that actually, you know, this type of development is quite expensive if you do it experimentally. Um, you know, and, and companies at the moment, you know, because this is a, uh, a economically viable field are much better to do this. But of course, you know, they don't talk to us or at least immediately they want all the IP. Um, uh, and, and so we couldn't screen like 100 materials at the moment in any academic uh, setting uh, in order to see, you know, whether we can improve the mobility. Uh, but uh, the bottom line of this is, yes, uh, indeed, you know, the predicted mobility of the material is about three years of magnitude better um, and the experimental mobility uh, is even uh, better than uh, anticipated. Um, now we have new materials in the pipeline, uh, you know, which are uh, again three orders of magnitude better. And now this starts to become interesting because if you would put this into a device, you would revolutionize basically uh, uh, the OLED materials market. Um, so can we go further? Yes. You know, so what I've talked about so far is we can deposit things and we can you know calculate these polarant energies um, but what we can do now is we can take these relatively small samples that we can treat uh, with the methods that I've talked about before sort of a more or less on an ab initio level and we can extend them statistically all the way up to device right um, and then you know solve uh, the whole device physics using a master equation or kinetic Monte Carlo approach um, and then what you see here in dots uh, is the experiment um, and in uh, lines, uh, the theory um, and uh, sorry, in the experiment is the open squares and the dots and the lines are uh, different levels of you know, theory, all based on the same ab initio data. And then you see you get pretty much picture perfect agreement uh, for some not totally trivial device. right? Uh, you can put a little bit further um, and you look at, uh, you know, uh, single layer, you know, uh, IV characteristic of single layer devices of, uh, you know, different materials. And you can see that again, you know, we get an agreement that I would say at the moment is uh, quite satisfactory, uh, given the fact that uh, we don't really know how to model, um, you know, disorder induced by impurities. Uh, uh, in these materials. So the theoretical estimates are always a little bit better um, uh, uh, than what is actually experimentally measured. Um, and so what I would like, uh, you know, to give you as a take home message is that, you know, these multi-scale models are a computational microscope for organic semiconductors and, you know, devices that we make out of them. Um, if you manage to place together uh, or put together these components that range from the nano scale, you know, to essentially the device scale. Um, and that is, you know, uh, getting close uh, to what I tried to motivate at the beginning uh, as the availability uh, of a uh, uh, digital twin. Um, and indeed, you now uh, these models are now used in industry 
um, to model the materials, you know, and if we keep at it, maybe for another few years, um, you know, will lead to an integrated device model, you know, similar to this uh, process development kit uh, that I have alluded to in the introduction. Uh, with that, I would like to thank, uh, you know, many people who have helped us along the way. Uh, you know, starting with Christian Lennertz and Falk Mai, who uh, were at the time at BASF, um, our colleagues uh, in the University of Mons and the University of Eindhoven, uh, our colleagues uh, in uh, Sony um, uh, and Novalet um, uh, and at the University of Bath. Um, much of the work uh, in terms of method development that I presented here was you know, done by one really brilliant PhD student who is now a junior professor for artificial intelligence and materials research, Pascal Friedrich, uh, but also the other people who are on this uh, list on the right contributed. Uh, Artem Fedi uh, did a lot of work on molecular doping, which I didn't have time you know, to discuss today. Um, there was uh, some uh, funding which helped us tremendously you know, uh, to get uh, this work done. Um, and with that, I thank you for your attention and you know, in this virtual setup, hope that um, we have some way of uh, discussing this. Thank you.